Hey students, this is Professor Gore, and uh, <clears throat> in this lecture, uh, just like the previous ones, we're going to divide this up into three parts. And this one's on um, American expansion or American imperialism. And what's going to happen um, is this is kind of focused on what, what is happening in the late 1800s and really around the turn of the century and then uh, in the few years after the turn of the century leading up to World War I. And then I'll cover World War I in a separate uh, lecture and so forth. Um, so basically, if you remember, for those who have taken U.S. History I, um, U.S. military pretty much after every war sh shrunk. So after the American Revolution, uh, we had a very, uh, we really didn't have a standing army uh, or Navy at all. During the Quasi Naval War with uh, France, uh, John Adams created a, a Navy in the United States Marines. Um, and then the War of 1812, our army expanded. Then after the war ended, it, it, it shrunk down to not much at all. And then same thing with the Mexican uh, American War. And then the U.S. Civil War is the biggest the United States military has ever gotten to up to that point. Uh, but it shrunk to a pretty small force to deal with Native Americans um, on the frontier. So you'll see that, uh, uh, you know, in the 1880s, we, our army was smaller than Bulgaria, a country in southeastern Europe. Um, our Navy ranked 13th in the world. So in comparison, we are nowhere near becoming a world power. OK, but within 19 years, by 1900, Things were completely different because um, the United States is going to become a world power at the end of the Spanish-American War in 1898. With a population of about 50 million, the United States already ranked with great European powers in 1880 in terms of population. Now, part of that's from birth rate. Part of that is from immigration. In industrial production, the nation stood second only to Britain and was rapidly closing the gap. Um, the Civil War had put the United States at odds with both uh, France and Britain uh, because Britain had made a couple of blockade runners for the Confederacy, uh, the Confederate Navy. Um, and then there was also some problems with France when um, the French government helped overthrow the Mexican government and put, put in Archduke Maximilian um, in 1863. And so the United States, if it wasn't for the American Civil War, the United States probably would have flexed the Monroe, Monroe Doctrine a little bit more so than what it did. Um, but by 1867, the, the French uh, leader, Maximilian, is actually uh, killed by a Mexican firing squad. Um, Britain basically, uh, after the American Civil War, did give independence to uh, Canada in 1867. And after four more years, Britain agreed to pay compensation for damages caused by uh, the Confederate blockade runner, the CSS Alabama, as well as a couple others that they have built for the Confederacy. All right, so why was American expansion of the 1890s different from earlier expansionist moves? Well, if you had me for U.S. History 1 or have taken U.S. History 1 um, with somebody else or elsewhere, um, you should know the United States expanded west, okay? Now, um, but by the 1890s, the difference with expansionist moves is now it's going to be overseas. You're going to see the United States is going to acquire uh, part of the Solomon Islands, Guam, Puerto Rico, uh, the Philippines, uh, and so forth. So... Really, even though the, these issues of Britain and France that happened um, during and right after the American Civil War, the United States is kind of much not involved in foreign affairs. That's going to change in the last 20 years of the 1800s. Telegraphic cables crossed the ocean and gave countries the capacity for immediate communication. Nevertheless, the U.S. kept the world at a distance and gave Americans a sense of isolation and security thanks to wide oceans. That's going to change in the 20th century, particularly after World War II. Um, the administration of Chester A. Arthur began a modest upgrading program, commissioning new ships, raising the standards for the officer corps and founding the Naval War College. So that's at Annapolis. I've had a, a former student of mine who's graduated from Annap uh, Annapolis, which is uh, one of the top institutions in the country, regardless of it being military or not. Um, but ne nevertheless, despite ex uh, kind of upgrading our Navy, our Navy is still pretty small. Um, we really didn't have a unified Naval Command and really deployed our Navy for coastal defense. Um, the conduct of diplomacy was likewise of little account. Appointment to the Foreign Service was mostly through the spool system until the Pendleton Service Act came into play. Uh, American envoys and cons uh, consular officers were a mixed lot with many idlers and drunklers among the hardworking and competent. So you had some that were good, some are not good. For its part, the State Department tended to be inactive, exerting little control over either policy or its mission abroad. 
In Asia, Africa, and the Pacific Islands, the American presence was likely to be Christian missionaries and many of them women. So bottom line is the United States is isolated, okay? Now, George Washington in his farewell address encouraged Americans to um, stay out of foreign affairs, which we do until we get to um, later conflicts at the very end of the 1800s and in the World Wars. Um, so one thing that does happen, I'm sorry about uh, Commodore Matthew Perry, uh, his, the image, um, for whatever reason, uploading um, was damaged. Uh, Matthew Perry actually looks a little bit different than that. Uh, but basically, Matthew Perry was a naval officer that was dispatched to the Pacific in 1853 and was told to open up trade with Japan. Well, Japan, for those that have had World History II, uh, when the Togawa shogunate takes over, they, in the 1500s, they go from uh, being somewhat curious of the Portuguese, uh, the Dutch, um, and so forth. They go to completely isolated and keep out foreign affairs and kick out all foreigners um, and, and force them to abandon Christianity. Um, so from the 1500s, when the Togawa shogunate takes over until uh, Commodore Matthew Perry comes in, Japan is relatively isolated. But Matthew Perry um, fires a few shots off of cannons and demands to, to meet with the Japanese officials. The Japanese comply. Uh, the United, United States wants to open up trade with Japan, and Japan ends up complying. Now, what's going to be the, the, the long-term significance of that is that Japan uh, eventually, once the Togawa shogunate is overthrown, with the Meiji Restoration, uh, what you're going to see is, is that Japan is going to become obsessed with everything Western. They're going to modernize their country more rapidly than probably any other country has modernized. They're going to become an industrial powerhouse, a naval powerhouse, and an army powerhouse. Um, and in the 1900s, um, they are going to beat Russia, uh, beat some German forces in World War One, and then eventually attack the United States uh, December 7, 1941. So I've talked about um, the problems with Britain and France uh, and Chester Arthur upgrading the United States military, but let's get into Latin America. Uh, despite expansion um, dreams before, during and immediately after the Civil War, territorial expansion in the Caribbean was non-existent. The Senate regularly blocked later moves to acquire bases in Haiti, Cuba, and Venezuela. Diplomatic activity quickened with the energetic James E. Blaine became Secretary of State in 1881. He got involved in a border dispute between Mexico and Guatemala. So... Um, and he also tried to settle a war Chile was waging against Peru and Bolivia and called the first Pan-American Conference. Uh, Blaine's interventions went badly, though, and the Pan-American Conference was called off anyway. Pan-Americanism was a notion of a community of states of the Western Hemisphere that took root once Blaine came back in office in 1889. He established an office in Washington called the Pan-American Union. In 1891, a riot erupted in Valparaiso, Chile, over American sailors visiting. Uh, threatened with war, Chile apologized to the United States and paid an, an indemnity of $75,000. Uh, now, in the Pacific theater, um, you had a lot of missionaries going to Hawaii, and Hawaii is starting to develop a thriving sugar um, cultivation business. And part of that is because of American sugar growers came there and um, either bought or seized territory um, and um, began growing sugar. Also, Hawaii began having quite a few immigrants come there to find farm work. So you had Japanese that came there, Chinese that came there um, to find work uh, in the, the relative sugar plantations and so forth. So, um, but Hawaii became very important because it's halfway across the Pacific Ocean. Um, later, when we get to the Spanish-American War part, I'll talk about Hawaii getting annexed in 1898 during the Spanish-American War as a repair and a fueling station for the United States Navy. Uh, that repair and fueling station came to become what we now know as Pearl Harbor. Um, that in San Diego is primarily where our Pacific Naval Fleet is located today. Um, now, in 1875, a treaty with Hawaii, uh, uh, with Hawaii gave uh, sugar duty-free entry into the American market, which means no tax taxes on, on imports, so no tariffs, uh, and declared the islands off limits to others. A second treaty in 1887 granted the United States naval rights at Pearl Harbor. The McKinley Tariff of 1890 ended a no days in Hawaii. And so one of the things that uh, um, uh, just a second. 